Welcome to the LPP Podcast. LPP is the Life Process Program, a non-12-step program for people who want to ameliorate addiction and addiction-related issues in their lives. By the way, when I say addiction, I don't mean only drug and alcohol addiction, but also addiction to love, sex, gambling, pornography, technology, and a whole range of other experiences. To learn more about the program or to check out free resources like articles, videos, blogs, and podcast episodes related to solving addiction-related problems, visit our website at lifeprocessprogram.com or follow us on social media using any of the links in the show notes. You're listening to a segment called MMA, Monday Morning Ammunition. Some of our shows are long-form interviews, Monday Morning Ammunition episodes are short, educational segments that you might listen to during your morning routine or during your Monday morning commute. Today you'll hear part four of an eight-part discussion that I recorded with LPP creator, Dr. Stanton Peel. And you may wonder, why are there eight separate segments? That's because our program consists of eight modules, each of which encourage participants to think critically about different dimensions of their lives and what it is they'd like to accomplish. So today we discuss module four, rewards. Now enjoy the show. Next module is rewards and how, how rewards come to play a role in overcoming addiction. Are addictions rewarding is, I guess, the kind of key question. Right. Which gets us into what the heck's a reward? Are you, are you turning that to me? I'm asking you. It's, you know, one of the questions I know you've kind of thrown, thrown out there as a, a, a discussion point. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, whatever the experience is that somebody is addicted to, at some point in their lives, they've had to learn that it serves a purpose for them. And that has rewarded them to some extent. So, of course, addictions are rewarding. And at the same time, intrinsic to the definition, our definition of addiction is the fact that it's also destructive. So it's rewarding in sort of an illusory way or or an incomplete way. And I think that what we discuss in our module where we discuss rewards is, well, how can you have, how can you find gratification and how can you get rewards from life in ways other than the things that have led to your addiction and how how can you get those to outweigh whatever the rewards are that you're getting from your addiction so that you don't have to also you know have this destructive cycle tag along with you so one of the things we've talked about is um, we've talked about what is an addiction and we've talked about how the addictions ensconce themselves in your lives and we go through one a cycle or a set of criteria, and um, we accept that the addiction is rewarding. We don't think people are crazy. We don't think they have some strange disease that makes them do something. We've explored with them why they're finding the addiction rewarding, and we have a list of criteria. I, I change it maybe from time to time, but in the first place, addictions tend to be pretty powerful in your life. They take of a pretty big space of your consciousness or your feelings. Um, secondly, they tend to be predictable and guaranteeable. I mean, what makes an addiction ensconce itself so firmly in your life is they're easy to reproduce, replicate. I mean, it's easy to take a pill. It's easy to smoke. It's easy to go someplace and gamble. It's easy to eat. It's easy to shop. I mean, and so you're trying to motivate. You're you're taking something that's all encompassing, and it gives you feelings. I I, I might have skipped a criteria. It gives you some kind of feeling of of being okay about yourself, of being in control of your life, of giving you some kind of short-term reward, like well, you're feeding yourself, so you're being good to yourself. It's a way of maybe simplifying the world around you. Well, all I have to do is smoke and I don't have to think about everything else. Mm. And as I said, it's, so it's a powerful thing. It gives you a specific emotional or other kind of a feeling that's rewarding. It's predictable and reproducible. And so you know how to get that reward. And as you said, in, it's a cyclical thing where ultimately its impact is negative. And, and one of the rewards that it gives you is often in a strange way feeling okay about yourself, which is funny because it's an addiction, 
I mean, most people aren't feeling good about smoking or eating too much, but in a way it gives you some kind of a positive feeling about yourself. And what makes it an addiction is two things. It's impairing, it's hurting your ability to deal with other parts of your life, your family, your children. I talk about one guy uh, who was so heavy, he fell over with his child and he was ashamed of himself because, you know, ordinarily, if you overeat, you're not thinking, well, how's that affect my kid? But that was a pretty direct example of it. And so... It was impairing his ability in some area that was most important to him, and it caused him distress in thinking about himself. And that's part of the cycle. Powerful experience that gives you needed rewards in a predictable way, but that has consequences that are impairing if your ability to deal with the world, and in some level causes you distress to think in thinking about yourself. And what makes it an addiction is one way that you respond to the distress that you feel is to return to the addiction. I mean, you can just think about somebody, well, they're really worried about what their life is, where they're going in their life is uh, addicted to heroin, and they end up worrying about it so much that they shoot up, because that's just the best way they have of dealing with those feelings. And so what we talk about in the Life Process Program is we've explored what those feelings are like, how the addiction produces them. And now what we're saying is, can we together think about other ways to get rewards in life that are realistic? We're not, you know, we're not going to say, oh, I'm going to go to the gym three times a day or I'm going to become religious or I'm going to, you know, get a PhD that are somehow rewards that are obtainable and available to you in your world around you, and that those rewards are going to be able to sustain your going to that, in your case, Zach, exercise program every day, and that you'll be able to feel enough good about that they'll be able to supplant the rewards you were getting from doing the other things. And so, uh, you know, an obvious example of that, which you and I have just both discussed, is like, you know, going to the gym and exercising. You know, you usually feel okay when you get done doing that. You know, mm-hmm. you say, huh, I've done something good for myself. I feel good. I'll sleep better tonight. Maybe only one-tenth of one-hundredth of a percent, I've increased my muscle tone and my endurance and my ability to breathe better. And those are rewards that are real and you're – appreciating and mindful of them and you may even be building them up maybe you know extending them more than they actually are occurring kind of forward projecting well if i keep doing this you know pretty soon i'll be in good shape and those are people do things for rewarding reasons if uh, the disease model of addiction we haven't spoken about it much says like the addiction is an accident Oh, you took the heroin, you took the painkiller, and it took over your body chemically. But we're saying it's motivated behavior. We've gone over the reasons you did the addiction, your motivation for using the addictive activity, and what motivations you have to want to do otherwise. And now we need to put in place substitute kinds of rewards. People don't do things for nothing. They have to believe, if you can't convince a person or they can't convince themselves, I should say, that what they're going to get out of this is better than what they got when they came in, well, you and they aren't going to win the game. You know, they can save their money and just carry on. I'm going to smuggle in a question for you here that uh, we haven't talked about, but I know you've thought about. There's an idea that the disease model helps people build an essence around that that they think that it's one or the other. Like if they're addicted to something, they need to begin doing that new, more healthful, rewarding thing. And if they fall back or regress into the kind of behavior that feeds into an addiction cycle, then they've inherently lost or need to start over. I think that we both believe that healthy rewards are rewards that are rewarding because they kind of feed into a new idea of who you are, like you were explaining. That doesn't... You having... 
let's say smoking on a Sunday after you've worked out on a Saturday and you're trying to quit smoking, uh, that doesn't mean you have to start over. Uh, maybe right. you could touch on that a minute. Yeah, we're very much against the disease. We're, we don't think it's healthy. One of the worst things about the disease model is, well, if you ha- I mean, the worst thing in AA is if you were drunk all day every day for 10 years and you don't have a drink for six years and then you go out and have a beer, you have to go back. You've lost all your chips and you have to start at day one. How can that possibly it's just who thinks that's good? And I mean, we can go back to children. You work with children. You know, if a child uh, bites his nails and or her nails and then they stop doing it for a month and they bite their nails one day because they're super worried about it, you don't scream at them and say, oh, you've blown your whole operation. Oh, right, right. Of course, you want to reflect back on how well they've been doing, all the motivation that enabled them to get this far. And in addition, you're talking about, uh, I think a key word here is incremental. I mean, losing weight and going to the gym are not like Uncle Ozzy quitting smoking. By the way, we never did get to my Uncle Ozzy's value specifically, uh, which was politically, he was very left wing. And that being under the control of the tobacco company that was a value that was very specific to him. So one of the jokes I make, oh, so the cure to smoking is being a communist, right? <laughs> that gets back to, well, you have to pick your own values. Right. But getting back to positive changes in your life, I mean, you know, some people could smoking one day and they don't smoke again for the rest of their lives, which in Oscar's case was 50 more years. Good for them. But there's a lot of behaviors where that's impossible. Eating love relationships, um, exercise, in a way they're better models of what addiction change is about because you're not going to change everything all at once. It's not going to be all or nothing. It's going to be incremental and you're going to get certain better feelings. You're going to still do some of what you used to do that wasn't so good. You're still going to have, you know, eat snacks when you shouldn't have. And what you need to do is summon your appreciation, pat yourself on the back, recognize that you have made these improvements and incremental improvements are good. That's the way most of life takes place. We're living in a, you know, we're, we're going for the long haul here and it's fine. You know, you don't want to lie to yourself and think, you know, if you go out every time you go to the gym afterwards, you eat a pork pie, you're probably not headed in the right direction. But you do need to focus on what it is good that you're doing and what it is good that you're getting from it. You've got to appreciate, well, I am feeling better. I am going to sleep better. I am feeling more relaxed in terms of exercise. When you quit smoking, you could be thinking, oh my God, I'm so nervous. If I smoke now, at least I will release the tension. You've got to focus on, well, I am feeling better. I am breathing better. I smell better. People react to me more positively. I'm doing better by my children. Uh, I can go out and breathe the fresh air better. The rewards are sometimes self-evident and sometimes you've got to cultivate them. And that's a better, in a way... Um, in a way, eating is a better model for addiction change than um, quitting a drug. Although, I mean, I know in, in your case, Zach, you were not an, an all or nothing uh, heroin quitter. You, um, you segued into that, which is not, well, I don't know who made up the decision about what's the right way to do it. But you gradually replace one set of rewards with another. Is that does that ring a bell in your case? Yeah, actually, I have a I have a more um, maybe relatable case. I, I'll circle back to this. Actually, somebody that I've been working with has been trying to quit smoking, and it was just sort of a side project that they wanted to go to the gym and run, and they wanted to they wanted to be more healthy generally, and they realized even though this wasn't a the idea wasn't, well, I'll go to the gym and that'll help me quit smoking. It was just sort of a, a side thought that that's also something that I want to be doing. It became very rewarding to them and they, they love the feeling 
they were getting from going to the gym. They made the connection actually that it, it sort of gave them some of the same sensations that they get from smoking. They were more alert in a better mood. It was a stress reducer. And then they started noticing as they were cranking up how much they were running, they were short of breath and decided, you know, I, I actually can't do both of these things. And at this point, I've got some momentum built up around my workout regimen. So I'm going to cut back on smoking. And, you know, this is a person who was smoking while they were working out. And then they wanted to cut back and, and they smoked less, not none. And then they just wound up sort of naturally and gradually smoking none. That's basically That's almost an ideal. Right. It's almost an ideal. You're realizing one set of values and getting new rewards that gradually usurp the old addictive rewards. And of course, you're rooting for the new rewards. That's, you know, you, you want to be a runner and not a smoker. And especially if you're coming to the Life Process Program, you're spending money to do this. But uh, it's a perfect example of how addiction is a motivated, rewarding behavior and how you're replacing that with a different set of rewards. We, I use the word incremental. Another word that pops up here is incompatible. Mm, it's a yeah. little bit you're not going to be doing such a good exercise program if you're smoking heavily they they don't work too well together so and those tie so, into each other you could say well i don't want to do xyz because well my addiction keeps me from doing it but if you start doing xyz and it becomes enjoyable that balance shifts you say i kind of can't do my addiction because xyz i have to do that and we're going to get into that. I mean, I, I mean, it's a lot. I mean, there's eight modules in the life process program. <laughs> I mean, you know, when your 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 whole life isn't going to take place in eight modules or eight weeks, but we're going to get into a point where we talk about um, there's a new you there that people often can't imagine. Where those new rewards, if you would have at the beginning of the process said, "Oh, these new rewards are going to replace the old rewards." They would have said, oh, you're crazy. Or they, you know, they put themselves down and say, that'll never happen. Right. But it happens. We've all, I mean, you don't personally, you know, sh take her, shoot heroin anymore. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at one point in your life, you wouldn't have bet a ton. You couldn't have imagined that that was going to be the case. But now it's not like you're sitting around thinking about shooting up. You've got a whole other very complex life you've got a daughter and a wife you've got a job you've got projects you've got self-esteem you're a totally i mean you're not a different person but you're not that addict right you couldn't be that addict anymore and you know uh we don't want to hold out every a dream for everybody but people at some point do make that shift almost entirely and we want to preview that and tell them the way you get there is by accumulating small rewards and building on them along the way. So I think that's probably a good place to hang it up for now since we're at a halfway point and we'll discuss several more modules. Do you have anything that you want to add about just the lot of the, the four different modules and dimensions of life and um, strategies for change that we were talking about today? Well, I, one thing I, we always have to remind people, we began our discussion with this. We're having a conversation and you and I come from our own backgrounds and we have our own views on this work and we work with people. But this is about the human being that we're dealing with. The, the actual life process program isn't about you and me having clever conversations and coming up with good examples. The Life Process Program is about a person thinking about and working in their own best. They're the client. They're paying to get this to happen. They want, they have a goal. And it's all, it's about them. I mean, it's about how they think and what they do. Fundamentally, their belief that they're in charge of this process and of themselves. All right. Plenty to talk about next time. Stanton, thank you so much for talking today and we'll do part two very soon very excellent great talking with you zach and bless all of our uh, lpp participants